Well, good morning and welcome. Welcome to Southside Bible Church. <clears throat> Special welcome to the visitors. We're glad to have you with us and to worship our God together. I got a couple announcements I want to make. We have uh, a dear brother who has been live streaming for five years with a severe uh, illness and kidney disorder, and he is able to join us this morning for worship. So a special welcome to Mike Murphy. <laughs> he has been praying faithfully for you, and it's been live streaming, and he's just one in heart. So what a joy to have our dear brother back. And then I have a wedding that happened this week, so I'm going to ask uh, Frances Hamner, Erlene, many of you know her by, and Dale Batson, are they here? Oh, there they are. They got married this week. <laughs> they want to build a marriage on Jesus Christ, and so grateful for them. Well, this morning, we will take back up in our study in Romans. If you'll turn to Romans chapter 13, we finished chapter 12. I know that's something we're celebrating as a church, so we are excited to move into chapter 13. We're going to look at what is God's will for us in respect to government, governmental authorities. How are we to think about it as the people of God? What should be, Paul's always going to get to the heart attitude. What should be the heart attitude of the believers of God towards these officials. And, and uh, as always, Paul will address it in a very gospel way, uh, in a beautiful way. So Romans 13, 1 through 7 will be our section for the next couple of weeks. And it just has much to teach us on this subject. It's not an exhaustive treatise on governmental issues. You're not going to get the answer for everything you've ever wanted to know uh, about uh, how we re react and respond to government but it lays out really the big principles. And it doesn't even address some of the exceptions. Is there ever time for civil disobedience? What about this? What about that? Paul's actually not going to even address those things in this passage. And I think many times we, we come to this passage, and, and in America especially, we start looking for the exception clauses before we understand the principles. But before we understand what does God want us to understand and to obey? What do I not have to obey is usually the response. We want to look at the exceptions to the rule before we look at the rule. And quite simply, we are to be the best citizens on the face of the earth, the children of God. Commentator Douglas Moo said, it's not a slight exaggeration that the history of the interpretation of these verses is an attempt to avoid what it says. And so I want you to come and let us reason together as the people of God and the Word of God and understand what is the will of God. Remember back to Romans 12 that Paul says we're to understand what is the will of God. And this whole section is what is God's will? I want to offer up my body a living sacrifice. What's your will for governmental officials in my Christian life? So I want to try to get the principle first because I think we like the exceptions more than the command. And then next week... I want to address maybe some of the exceptions. But I just want to begin that Romans 12, 1 is by the mercies of God, I offer up my body a living sacrifice. God, here's my life. It's yours. I just, I lay it down for you. And this morning, he's going to say, here's the will of God. This is my will, says God, for you. If you want to offer up your body a living sacrifice, here's how you do it in regards to governmental officials. And then Romans 12, 2 says, don't be conformed to this world. Don't take on its thinking, its thoughts, its attitude. And what would its attitude be towards authority? It's, it's in general, it despises authority because our flesh wants self-rule. And usually it questions all authority. It resists it. It grumbles against it. It sits in animosity if their party does not have the majority of the House or Senate or presidential seat. It's just ingrained in our very fiber. Anarchy has sprung up in some areas in our country since COVID, and it's just destroying those areas. It's shipwrecking them. You drive through them, and it's just decaying, deteriorating. There, there's crime everywhere. Police can't even go in. Anarchy is a dangerous thing 
And, and the distrust of government and animosity towards it is just at an all-time high in our country. So when Paul says in verse 7, give honor to whom honor is due and respect to whom uh, respect is due, we're going to be wanting. And so Paul's concerned about our heart attitudes in response to the authority that we'll see this morning that God has placed over us. If that causes your skin to eat, crawl just a little bit, you came to the right place this morning if you're a child of God. Uh, it, it's the spirit of the age. It hates authority. This age hates everything and anything to do with authority, which this morning is, is to hate God. God has chosen to run his universe by structures and authorities. It's the, the plan and the wisdom of God of how he works out his program. So this is the will of God. Paul says, this is your spiritual act of worship. You want to worship God? You're going to worship him by the way you submit to your governmental authorities. This is the law of Christ. How do I love my leaders and respect and pray for them? And you'll see even the evil ones. Uh, how do I do that? So prepare for the scalpel this morning. That, that's your anesthesia, your, your prep. What's the stuff, the yellow stuff that cleans you up first? That, that was it. You're ready. May our God and Father conform our minds and our hearts to His will so we can offer up our bodies a living sacrifice to God with the authorities that He's placed over us. And we will be a bright light in a world that despises authority in our day and age. You're going to stand out uh, in a beautiful way in this world, especially when the rulers go against Judeo-Christian values and they do want to harm us. What will submission look like? <coughs> the aroma of Jesus Christ. So, uh, in case you didn't know it, Jesus was under some bad government. He had Herod and Pontius Pilate who violated all justice to put him up on a cross and he went like a lamb led to the slaughter. He submitted to their injustice and he spoke in love and truth through that whole mock crucifixion and trial. Jesus Christ understood what we are looking at this morning. When the religious leaders wanted to trap him, they said, uh, are we to pay taxes to Caesar? They, they wanted to stir up a revival, a revolt. And he, he said, give me a coin. Whose inscription is on it? Or Caesar. He said, then render unto Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God's. And he just silences them. Give, give what's, what's Caesar's, give it to him and give to God what is God's. And his image is, is inscribed in you. Give him your life. Give God everything. Render to God your whole being. And that's my goal in the text that we'll be looking at. Paul, five years before he penned Romans, Claudius expelled all the Christians and the Jews out of the city of Rome, most likely for fear of the government that they're growing and it's going to spread and they might take this over. And we all know how ungodly and unruly the laws of the government were at the time when Paul penned this letter. Uh, anarchy, just sin running around and abounding. And Paul has been persecuted many times by the government he will write about. He's going to call us to submit to the government. It's going to cut his head off. They knew nothing about the sweet spot that we live in America as this is being written. And so will you come with me this morning and let the Spirit make this text clear and let it operate on the flesh that has grown up in our hearts. And I've just been asking them, will you cut off flesh? from our hearts that are sinful this morning and bring us into sweet submission to the authority that God has raised up so we can give God our spiritual act of worship. And I've, I'm in much pain from my study all week and I want to have koinonia with you this morning. And so I'd like for you to come join me. So let me read Romans 13, 1 through 7 and we'll pray and open up the word of God. Romans 13, 1. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there's no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good and you'll have praise from the same. For it is a minister, of these, these authorities, of God. They're ministers of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. 
For it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it's a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it's necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for your conscience' sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. Why do you have to mention that? You pay taxes for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. So render to all what is due them. Tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. <clears throat> Let us go to our God and pray for his will in our lives. Father, as we open this up, I do, I pray that in each one of our lives, the children of God, that you would conform us to Christ. I pray for these uh, ungodly, fleshly desires that uh, rise up against authority. God, these desires that want to be our own king and our own master, and we know the best ways for everything. God, I pray that you would have your way in us this morning with this word. God, that you would bring us into humble submission, that you would bring us into this sweet place of being an aroma, a fragrant aroma to our God the sweet aroma of Christ who modeled this so beautifully to us. God, work in our hearts. Let us all walk out of here more like Jesus Christ as a result of our worship this morning. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So my first question, why does Paul go from the heights of Romans chapter 12, probably the best chapter on the body of Christ and our deep agape for one another? I love Romans 12. And if we could get that, we would be a city set on a hill, shining into a dark, hateful world. Why now does Paul jump off this cliff from the the top of the mountain of chapter 12, agape love and service, into our attitudes and responses to the government? Doesn't it just kind of feel like a whole new book? I I, I think this is the flow then of, of Paul's logic and thought. I can't be dogmatic, but we just spent two weeks on Romans 12, 14 through 21, Bless those who persecute you, bless and curse not. And he concludes his argument, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. (laughs) So how do we deal with the evil that comes at us on a daily basis? We learned in Romans 12 how to cover it, how to love, forgive, forbear. It was just a rich section in a challenging section. And now I think Paul takes it to another level. This isn't a new book. This is another dimension for the Christian. What, what do we do when evil comes at us from a hierarchy, from a government, something that's antithetical to Christianity, the, the macro to the micro? As he writes this, there's a government that's opposed to Christianity. And so Paul found himself before many tribunals and officials, Agrippa and, and many. And so it, I, I think that's where he's going, is, is now how do we deal with government and and our attitudes and our thoughts and and even when we don't like where it's going. In a couple of years in this region, there's going to be a huge rebellion in a group that's going to rise up because of the tax burden that was upon them. So this is very weighty and it's abusive at times. Taxes have always been an issue and that's going to be his first application is what we do with taxes. So Paul is further instructing us How do we deal with injustice and evil and malicious designs against our faith? Uh, President Biden, I can't go give him a cup of water. I can't feed him, it said, when your enemy's hungry. So if I feel that he's wronging me, how do I love him? How do I return evil with good? What do we do with, with these kind of problems, Paul? And so his instruction, I believe, was not what these early Christians were wanting to hear and maybe not what we want to hear this morning in our present day Rome and what we're facing and frustrated with. But if you'll receive this teaching, I I think it can bring deep peace to your troubled and anxious heart about our government. There seems to be a consternation that many are carrying around, and I'm just praying this morning that maybe that could be delivered and set free. Uh, the, The ruin that could come to our country. Some of you have given your lives to fight for our rights and the shipwreck of our our personal finances that could follow as well. Paul is going to do what Fox News has never been able to do. He's going to bring peace and not anger and anxiety about our government. 
And so I pray this morning, that's what I want, is for the peace of the body of Christ to shine in this world where everybody's anxious and angry and, and slandering and belittling, and we're going to be these trusters, just loving God and submitting to authority gladly. You're, you're going to stand out and be a city set on a hill. So that's where we're going we're gonna to go. Let's, uh, Romans 13, 1 through 7. Your outlines are Paul is going to give us six reasons why we should submit to governing authorities. And that should kind of wake you up just there. Why do I need six reasons to know how to submit to the government? What do you think? Kyle, what do you think? Because <laughs> it's hard. I fight it. So Paul's got to persuade us from a lot of different angles to get our conscience and our heart. So just come with me. I, I know I got to get some of your consciences and hearts this morning. But let's just start with just what he commands, and then we'll go through the six reasons. The six reasons is your, your submission is to God. That's why I submit. Second, if you resist, he says you're resisting God. Third, you're going to receive condemnation from God, maybe through the authorities. And fourth, there, there, there's a purpose for why God has put rulers over us. And then fifth, your own conscience sake, you need to keep it clear and clean, and so it will hurt your, your Christian walk, your life. And then number six, uh, they're servants of God. The, uh, the, they've been given as servants of God is how the Holy Spirit will give us these words this morning. I don't like to think of them that way. They're servants of God. How's that feel? Huh? How's that taste? <laughs> servants of God. I love it. All right. I'll quit uh, antagonizing you, and let's just go to the text. And let God work. Uh, the principle of responsibility, verse uh, one, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. Um, <clears throat> I want to look at who, whom, and what. So every person is the who. So just as we begin, there's no immunity here. There's no one outside of the jurisdiction of the government. This is believers and unbelievers, but Paul's addressing believers. And I just want you to see every person to be in subjection to the authority. So if you have an escape clause, drop it. Every person to whom what? The governing authorities. The Greek word is exousia. It's a compound word. Uh, the preposition ek means from or out of. Usia is a present participle to be, to, to have being or substance or essence. So exousia is, is essence or substance. It, it was used when Christ spoke. They said he's one who has authority when he spoke. And those who rule over us or lead over us carries this idea of exousia. It's, it's delegated power and authority. And so Paul just kind of leaves it open-ended. I want you to catch that. It does not say submit to democratic authorities. Submit to Republican authorities. Paul uh, set no form of government before us. He didn't say only submit to a democracy, only submit to socialist or communist. He doesn't even lay out what form of government. And he doesn't say to good authorities, but to governing authorities. You're to be in submission to these governing authorities that God has put over us. <clears throat> what are we to do? Be in subjection. The Greek word, it's a military term, hupotasso, and everyone here in the military knows exactly what that word means. I rank under, I come under my official, I bring myself willfully under him to lead, rule, and to guide. To submit, this Greek word's beautiful, it's, it's to bring the whole person not just grit in your teeth. It's, it's a, I call it a wholehearted submission. It's to, to wholeheartedly bring yourself under your authorities, to, to come under with that joyful heart. It's an imperative. God is commanding his blood-bought brought children, come under them, come under them. And he uses a, a, a therefore. <coughs> therefore, in uh, the gospel, these ones are to give a, a, a submission to the rulers over them. Those who have been blood-bought by Jesus Christ, who has sacrificed and died for your sins, these ones come under the governing authorities. The verb tense shows that it's to be a constant response of our lives to these authorities, not picking and choosing. Titus 3.1, remind them to be subject to rulers and to authorities, to be obedient, 
to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, and to be uncontentious and gentle and showing every consideration for all men. So as an observation, Paul does not address the times when we shouldn't submit to government. He doesn't give the exceptions. So what I'm getting from this is his burden in this text is that we submit to our authorities, right? So our presupposition then as children of God is to submit, to obey unless constrained that I ought not, and next week I'll give some of those reasons. But we're to be submissive, obedient citizens under the jurisdiction that we are placed under. It's not, I will only submit to what I agree with. That is the only way I'll come under these people. I've heard this, he's not my president. That's not the spirit of the Christian. It isn't. 1 Peter 2.11 Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers, Romans 12, 1, to abstain from your fleshly lusts which wage war against your soul. Your, your lusts are waging war. In what ways? Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may on account of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of their visitation, that you're, you're putting the gospel on display and they might even get saved. And he says, what behavior? Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. And that's Peter who submission wasn't his favorite issue. I pray that our excellent behavior in these areas would commend God to men. That our excellent behavior in these areas would show forth God to mankind. This attitude is foreign, whether it's any authorities as we journey, teachers, umpires, police officers, covenants, permits, licenses, taxes, speed limits, building permits, permits car seats. Uh, go, go Google it. There's thousands of laws in Colorado we're citizens, I mean, they got more laws than the Pharisees had. We're, we're citizens submitting to the authorities over us. Daniel, as we read this morning, uh, he, he was not in a democracy. He had Nebuchadnezzar who was his king. And in Daniel 6, 3, it says, Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit. This is being light. And the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. He's, he's just going to put him over the entire kingdom. Can I ask someone to do me a big favor? Can you close those two shades there in the back? I, I can't see anything. Um, in some ways, it's a blessing. In other ways, it's a curse. Uh, Daniel 6, 4. Then the commissioners and the satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs. So they're trying to find some way to trap that he's done something against the government and we can get him. But they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption. I pray that that would happen to me. Search it out, look it out, and they'd say, we can't find any grounds against him. And as much as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him, and these men said, we shall not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. The only way we're ever going to get him is if we get him because of how committed he is to his God. What a testimony. Christ, his cousin John, has been beheaded by Herod, the Roman government. Pilate mingled the blood of the Galileans. He'd seen horrific acts by the government, yet he wasn't about being a liberator from the government, but from sin. I came to set you free from sin. And he said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. Paul had Nero as king, and he had slavery and abortion just widespread. And Paul went about commending the gospel to men. The way we set men free and women and children is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so is the command clear? Uh, not all the exceptions, but just the command from our God. So you, you should have questions in your mind. I do. But is the, is the command clear as you sit here before your God? We need to hear this from our Lord. 
I want you to notice that Paul gives us six reasons now to submit to the government. And you know what that tells me again is it's a struggle. And we need to have our hearts persuaded further and deeper because our flesh is resistant to authority. The fall has done so much harm to submission. It just instantly broke it and and everything flipped in the garden. May God heal that in us this morning by the mercies of God. By the mercies of God, may it bring this kind of obedience. Not gritting your teeth, not begrudgingly, not angry, not okay, because I have to. I want to call this a glad surrender. This is a glad surrender because it is the will of God and who it is unto. So now I want to help loosen your heart to, to come to that place this morning in his word. And we're only going to be able to look at two this morning and we'll get the other four next week if the Lord doesn't return and I'm still alive. If I die, I want one of you brothers to finish this series out for me. 13.1b, for there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. God is the sovereign one sitting over this whole universe. He is, Christ said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. I, I, I have all authority. Everything is under me. Everyone and everything in this universe bows to God. If anyone or anything has authority, you better understand it has come from God. That, that is coming from God. Elders, husbands, mothers and fathers, presidents, this authority comes from God for God. He gives them authority. God does. So submission is not based on who is in power, but who's given the power. And Almighty God has given the power to the rulers, the authorities. And so the government, hear this, is not a human invention. It did, it did not evolve, but it is the mind and the will of God. It's His purpose to work out His grand purpose in this plan of redemption. And so God has ordained government and authorities for purposes of his kingdom. Christ said to Pilate in John 19, he said, Pilate, you would have no authority over me unless it's been given to you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me up to you has the greater sin. And so America, we are, we are the government of the people, for the people, and by the people. And Paul says, no, it's of God, for God, and by God. And we need to think that. We need to know that. The government in Rome was divinely instituted by God. And so is our government this morning as we sit here. And those which exist, our text says, are established by God. He set them there. And when you read this Bible, he raises up Assyria and he brings them down. He raises up Babylon. Isaiah 44 calls Cyrus, that king, my servant. He's he's working out my purpose is that king. Romans 9 says, I raised up Pharaoh for my purposes and how I will work it out. Acts 17, 26, he made from one every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. God's decreed and declared it all. Behind all the ballots is the sovereign pleasure of God. Those counted and not counted are the sovereign plan of God. Behind national conventions or coups, the the powers that be have been ordained by God. The Third Reich, Stalin, all of these things through history have been established by God. And he has his purposes, we saw in Romans 11, for all that he's doing to, to bring about showing mercy to Jew and Gentile and wrapping up all of history. God has purposes in all that he's doing. The commentator Robert Haldane said, no tyrant has ever seized power until God gave it to him. And he sets up kings and he brings them down. I'll never forget when uh, Saddam Hussein was caught and this man who was destroying and killing murderously people and, and just proud and arrogant and now he's hiding in a hole looking like he'd been in there for months. God rises up and he brings down. Whatever comes to pass is the decree of Almighty God. And so this is not to throw out human responsibility, but it's to enhance our trust 
and our submission to wherever we find ourselves this morning that God has established this authority and he has a purpose and he has a plan for what he's doing and I can trust. And we'll see that there is human responsibility and we'll talk about that next week, but I want you to get this big principle. So why does a Christian submit then? Because he trusts in the merciful God who saved him. He just, he trusts God. How can you look at this gospel and not trust God? It just demands good, wisdom, sovereignty. Whatever our, our God does, we, we submit because we trust him. Don't trust the government. Trust the God over it. I don't hope in government. I hope in Jesus Christ. He's seated at the right hand of God with full authority. My submission to the government is that God has established it and raised it up. My submission to it, it's, I want you to hear that. It's my spiritual act of worship. This isn't small. This is your worship. It's worship. It shows the world the value of the ruler who has first place in my heart and first place in my submission. Why are you so joyful with all that's going on? Because my king rules, right? Beautiful. Behind every government is the one who's governed by none. That is our sweet principle here this morning. By the mercies is my motivation to submit to governing authorities. It's not legalism for me. It's not just a rule that I grit my teeth. I can't have a glad surrender because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. And I want you to look at one more principle, and this one gets a little preachy, so hang in there with me. Uh, To inform our submission to our governing leaders, (coughs) look with me in verse 2. Therefore, one of my favorite words, whoever resists authority, so because God has established authority and called us to submit to it, therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. So our second point is to resist the government. Just hear that real clearly. It's to resist God. It feels so cool. It's to resist God. So submission, the Greek word was hupotasso, to to come under your authority. And it's an interesting play on words. To resist is antitasso. And so it means to, to not come under. To, to, anti means against. Uh, I, I won't come under authority. I'm against authority. I will not line up under you. The one who does that, he says, is going to bring this condemnation upon themselves. So it's, it's real simple. It's not the government you're resisting this morning. It's God. It's, it's not the authority that you're resisting, but the one who has set up all authority. It's God. And this is not the path to blessing. It's not the path to putting God on display. It's not the journey to have deep communion with God. It, it, it just it breaks communion with God. It's not the, the pleasure of God that you will get for your disobedience, um, but our text says you'll you'll receive condemnation upon yourself. And there's a lot to that. Is that through the government, God using it through the government? If you just stay in rebellion all of your life, it's wrath at the end. There's a lot of debate on that. But I just want you to realize that there's, there's condemnation for those who take this path. And it's so interesting that you're standing against this evil leadership because you're a follower of Christ while you're displeasing the one you want to please. Take that in. You're standing against him. He put the authority over you. And I pray that you come away with this this morning, how serious God takes the authorities and structures that he puts over us. They're big. They're they're from him. And he says, what is more? They're for your good. They're to bless you. One of the best leaders in the history of the Bible was Moses. And one day, this, this Korah and all of his gang rise up and say, hey, Moses, who are you? We're, we're all holy. <laughs> who do you think you are? And Moses is a sinful man that was called out by God to lead this people out of slavery through the wilderness and the promised land. It, it wasn't Moses. It was God who raised up Moses for their good. And how did God view it? 
the ground just opened up and swallowed them. Who are you? I've been nervous all week walking around, just afraid that ground's going to open up. Just swallow me up for some of my attitudes that I've had towards government. <clears throat> this has just struck a chord all week. You resist God, not the governmental authorities placed over us. And when you submit to them, you submit to God, it's worship. Wives, it's worship. I want you to catch this. It, it's your worship. It's showing God you are of more value than my government. I'm under this because I'm under you. And so our, our worship is shown by our submission to authorities that he's put over us. And I think the worster, that's not a word, the worse the leaders, the sweeter your worship to God is. I've seen some things that are unbelievable. The sweet worship. I hate to quote him. One preacher, Stuart Aliad, not that I have a problem with Stuart, but it hurt he said, the last time you exceeded the speed limit or jaywalked or shorted your taxable income, you resisted God. I should have left that out. I want to close with a couple of verses and, and draw our hearts into what we're to be about. Because the church uh, in the 80s and growing, it, it got off into political activism. And we believe that our, our calling was to, to make uh, uh, America run like the Bible and everything was just, we were, we we're trying to legislate morality versus the gospel changing and transforming lives. And it became a big movement. And then the, the social justice movement. And Jesus gave us a command that is to fill our heart and our time and our energies. And it's not to renew government. It's not to bring utopia to the earth, but it's all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all things that I've commanded, and surely I'll be with you always. The, the church is to take the gospel out, and as people believe, it's going to change societies. It's going to change so many things. Uh, uh, racism dies in the gospel. All the stuff that is out there transformation comes by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we're to give ourselves. Next week, we'll look at, sh should I protest? Should I fight certain things? And, you know, we'll, I'm going to say a big yes, but I'm going to explain why. But I just want you to see this morning that this church needs to be about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we need to make that all that we are. And we proclaim it. We share it anywhere and everywhere. And that is what brings true change. Paul before, or Luke 21.10, Jesus continued saying to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there'll be great earthquakes and in various places, plagues and famines. There'll be terrors and great signs from heaven. But therefore, all these things, they will lay their hands on you and they'll persecute you, delivering you to synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake, but it will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. So they're, they're going to come and they're going to persecute you and they're going to put you in prisons and they're going to kill you. And, and he's saying, don't just spend the rest of your days then protesting government. He says, it's going to lead to an opportunity for your testimony by your glad surrender, your trust, your faith in Jesus. And you're going to be like Ridley and Latimer as they're burned at the stake. We're going to set a fire in Europe that will never be put out. Before Agrippa, Paul Acts 28, Grippa replied to Paul, in a short time, Paul, you're going to persuade me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that whether in a short or long time, not only you, but everyone who hears me this day might become as I am except for these chains. Amen. Philippians 1.12, Paul says, I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater purpose of the gospel. He's in prison for preaching the gospel. And, and, and the whole book is about his joy. So that my imprisonment and the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole praetorian guard and to everyone else. I'm about the gospel and the gospel is spreading. And that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. All the Christians are gaining strength by my, my, my faith in prison and they're preaching more boldly than they ever have. 
Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, some from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel, but the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. Man, you should expose that. Uh, What then, Paul says, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. All I care about is that the gospel of Jesus Christ goes forth. That That is why we are here. It's the opposite of so much of what I see today. I'm going to skip a long section that I had. I don't think it's necessary. So we're going to close out. <laughs> we'll finish up the six reasons why we should submit next week. And then we're going to look at, is there a time to resist authority? And throughout the Bible, we'll see godly examples of when and how. And I want you to catch this in the attitude. That's going to be very important. But I wanted you to have a week for you to get alone with God and just deal with your heart and your attitude toward authority. Just spend time with the Lord and let him do some surgery. It's a God issue. It's a gospel issue. And you, and you got to get it to, to the root of why. Why am I so rebellious to authority? What, what is it in my heart that's making me this way? And so don't just stop you know, speeding. And I, I, I want something deeper. I want you to get along with God and say, what is it in my heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ that hasn't brought glad surrender to authority that's been placed over me and in my life? Some of you, authority is just fingernails on a chalkboard. And it, it's, it's, it's pride. And God, God can tell me what to do, but no human can. And Paul tells us this morning that human authority is from God, and it's him telling you what to do, even with immoral, ungodly, antagonistic leaders. This is your spiritual act of worship to God. This is how you love your God and your leaders. This is the law of liberty that we've been brought into. We should make it a joy for our government to lead us, because we are the best citizens with the best attitudes as we obey their laws and their ordinances. And so are we being conformed to the world? Are are we being drawn in to think like the world in this arena? Or do you have your feet dug in against your authorities that have been put over you by God? And you feel vindicated by it uh, when, when it's Jesus that you're resisting. Unless you're being asked to sin against God that we'll look at next week and some other uh, uh, possibilities with love, it's not because you don't like some policy or some political stance. And so I just want us to get this next week. We'll finish it up. But one, just a couple thoughts as I close. Don't look for presidents or officials to be Jesus for you. One thing that came out for me during covid was there's a lot of people who have made America their Jesus. And when it was falling apart, and there were a lot of wrong things going on in our country, you were undone because your country's Jesus. It, it brings peace. It, it's where I feel safe. It, you're, you're looking for country to be what Jesus Christ is supposed to be. So I just pray that this morning we would check ourselves to say, are we, are we looking for that to be Jesus, or are we looking for Jesus to be Jesus? And then secondly, the the USA is as close to paradise as you can get. I know we got our issues, but we have so many common graces. When you go to third world countries and different places, just to drive and have roads, and, and when you call 911, people show up and There are so many things that we can stand in a pulpit and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is so many common graces that God has given to this land, and we should be concerned about losing them. But I just want you to say, why? Because we have an opportunity to preach Jesus without having to go to jail tomorrow. And so we we can go up in evangelism and share and not have our heads cut off. And so we have an opportunity for the gospel that is unbelievable, unbelievable, and the window's closing. 
And so I just want to exhort and maybe challenge, are we redeeming this common grace that we have as Americans in this day, in this age, to do everything we can for the spread of the gospel because we have the freedom still to do that? And so I pray, redeem it. And then lastly, I'm glad I cut out that whole section. I just want to share the gospel. Um, If you've come this morning, and maybe you've been coming for 20 years, and you've never realized that the American dream for you is the gospel. You've tacked Christianity on, but the American dream is what you live for. And your, your, your liberties and what you have, that is, is, is your hope. And it just, it drives you. It's what you get passionate about. It's what you fight over. It is your hope. And instead of the American dream, I want to tell you about Jacob's dream. Jacob had this dream of heaven with this staircase and angels ascending and descending. And it's, it's this gospel that Jesus can bring you back into the presence of God. And so Romans 1 through 11, all that we've been seeing and learning that Jesus Christ came into the world and died on a cross for your sins because sins have to be punished. And God punished him in his own son on the cross. And Jesus was pure righteousness. He lived the life you should have. And God will put that to your account so you can be just before God this morning. You can be forgiven and accepted. And then the the dream is, is that I have God. I'm reconciled to God. I I know him. My life is God, making him known, knowing him, loving him. And so if if all your life has ever been is the American dream and treasuring that, and that's that's what makes your blood go up, I'm just asking you this morning to repent of a false God. America can't save you from sin. Jesus Christ can. And he came into this world and he offers to you this morning salvation in him and him alone. And when you have that, I just want to offer up my body a living sacrifice. And one way I do that is by this glad surrender to the authorities that God has put over me. And that's my spiritual act of worship. To God be the glory. Father, I come before you and these are hard words and they're difficult ones. Lord, I pray for some of the struggles and what are going on in minds and hearts now. Some of them are are right things that they're struggling with, and some are just pure sin. And so, Holy Spirit, would you sort out every individual here this morning? I just want every one of them to have glad surrender and worship to their God. I want them to be set free from the fear of, I got to fix this. I got to control the government. I Just this morning, shh, Holy Spirit, calm their hearts that that you raise up authorities and you change and you bring them down and you are working out your unfolding plan and, and how we tie into it, God. Just let us know we're safe now. The gospel has made us safe with you. Nothing can take our soul or bring our sin back on us. We're the safest people on the face of the earth. God, just let hearts be calmed in the gospel this morning and let not government uh, disrupt their peace but let it just bring their, their submission and that they can be at, at rest while we live quiet and peaceable lives for the name of Jesus Christ and seek to tell everyone we can about the name that is above every name. God bless us in our hearts this morning to have glad surrender. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.